an amazing panel to talk about Holloway Prison. I'm just going to tell you a little tiny bit first about Holly, Holloway's famous past inmates. Um, Sarah Graham is a freelance writer and editor who she, she put together this list. Um, suffragettes, obviously, were in the earliest 20th century. Most suffragettes were in Holloway, including Emmeline, Sylvia and Christabel Pank Pankhurst. I don't know if they shared a cell. Um, Christabel was arrested with fellow suffragette Anne Kenny in 1905 after um, interrupting a Liberal Party meeting. You can imagine how, that, how anybody would know nowadays. Um, her sister Sylvia was next to be arrested in 1906 when they started a protest in the lobby at the House of Commons. Um, the magistrate ordered the women to be of good behaviour for six months or go to prison for six weeks, and they chose prison. <laughs> um, Sylvia and Christabel's mother, Emmeline, was also arrested and imprisoned in Holloway for six weeks in 1908. She was in solitary confinement and staged her first hunger strike here. In fact, it, and the, and the um, suffragettes were mainly housed there. Murderers, the, the famous... The, the, in fact, Myra Hindley was the most famous murderer in prison in Holloway in 1966. While she was there, she fell in love with the prison officer, Patricia Cairns, who assisted her in a failed um, escape attempt, which some of us should remember, but I don't remember at all. Um, more recently, in its recent history, Holloway Prison, which was rebuilt during the 70s and has a population of 500 at the moment, has hosted, hosted the mur murderesses, including Amy Bartholomew, Rochelle Etherington, Emma Last, Ginny Crutcher, Alison Walder and Bella Colt. Um, so that's Holloway as it stands at the moment. Juliet, I know was in the visitor centre yesterday morning. But before we go there, let me just quickly introduce the panel. Juliet Lyons is head of the Prison Reform Trust. Maureen Mansfield works for Women in Prison, which has been running for 30 years. And Vicky Price has been in Holloway and also written a fabulous book about women in prison, which I in strongly enjoin you all to read. Over to you. Right. Thank you. Not at all. Thank you. I think I'll stand up, if that's all right. Um, um, this was taken in the 1990s. It's Holloway. It's a woman sweeping leaves. Um, in the 1990s, I spent two years working on commissions of prison service in Holloway, trying to devise a gender-specific training programme for staff. And the idea was to base ourselves there, to work in a couple of other prisons as well, Drake Hall and a couple of others, but, uh, but actually essentially to be talking to the women, listening to what they were telling us about what they thought made for a decent prison officer, and talking to the prison staff about what they thought made for a decent prison officer and putting it together in, a, in an extraordinarily short two-day training programme, um, which every member of staff in the end in the prison service did. The vast majority of women in prison have experienced domestic violence or some form of abuse. Uh, that doesn't mean everybody. It doesn't mean everybody has mental health problems, but there is a lot of that. So a lot of our training was about how do you respond sensitively to women who are sensitive themselves and and quite rightly so um and 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 it was a it was a peculiar tension really in the whole thing i was proud that to be asked to be part of it and we did do it and i was pleased that all the staff did it because up to that point staff had been trained simply to work with anyone who happened to be in a prison and 95 percent of the people who happened to be in a prison are men or young men so for only five percent of the prison population then and now are women uh, but the women's prison population managed to triple in about 30 years. But because sentences got harsher, because people who would have got uh, community sentences found themselves in prison, and because sentences got longer. Um, and why Holloway? Are we talking about it now? Because Holloway's going to close. It's going to close in the summer. The women who are there are being prepared for transition. Many of them, 40% are serving less than three months. 70% um, are serving less than a year. Very many of those women would have been out anyway by the summer. Some will transfer back nearer their homes out of London, but for many they'll be decanted into a prison in Surrey. And we're trying to say, do you really need to do that when you have other options? And one of the big other options is a, is a visitor centre on the site, which is very big and very beautiful. I'm going to show you a picture of it in a minute, uh, which could be a perfect place for a women's centre. It's a, currently a visitor centre for people who visit Holloway. And that's, of course, one of the big disadvantages of closing Holloway is that visitors and children who are visiting their mums, 17,000 children separated from their mums in the course of a year um, by imprisonment. So women and other visitors are going to have to trail out to um, not very easy to visit Downview or not very easy to visit Bronzefield. A whole range of charities, Hibiscus, um, women's charities that have supported women in prison, 
some good probation work, some very good mental health work, work with addiction. 70% of the women who arrive at Holloway currently go straight into detox. So, you know, there are huge questions about why do we use prison so much for women when we could do other things better. But we think, OK, if you're going to close it, think about something different. And this is a something different. Isn't it nice? Um, this is a visitor centre, as it was yesterday morning, um, before the visitors arrived. It's got a kitchen, it's got a cafe, it's got a creche, it's got group rooms, it's got offices, it's got disabled loos, changing facilities for children. It's got a huge area upstairs, currently re reused for prison service recruitment. Um, it, it's, a, it, it's threatened with being part of the closure of the whole site and being bulldozed along with it. We think um, it would be just a fabulous place to set up a women's centre. And a women's centre, for those of you who don't, I guess many of you know what that is, but just very quickly, it's a centre which can be used as a court disposal. So the courts can say, we're sending you on a community sentence, you have to attend this women's centre, you'll be supervised by probation or CRC nowadays. Um, and there are things that we'd like you to do there, and that might be um, it, con contact with mental health services or, or addiction services. Um, other women can use it who simply need that degree of support and help. There's one not dissimilar in look in Anawim in Birmingham, which is a really successful centre. There was a really good one in Glasgow called Centre 218. So there are up and running existing very productive and useful visitor cent uh, women's centres. Um, and the reconviction rates, instead of being 51%, which they are within one year of imprisonment and release from prison, the reconviction rates go down usually below 10%. And it's not just about reconviction, it's also about health and well-being and a woman feeling confident enough to find safe housing, to keep it, to keep care of her own children and to just feel that she can do things for herself instead of being dependent on an institution. So that's my intro. Lovely, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, just wondering whether I should stand also. <laughs> I think I will. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Maureen Mansfield and I work for an organisation called Women in Prison. Women in Prison, it's a very uh, 1980s feminist kind of name. Women in Prison was founded by a woman who was herself in Holloway, Chris Tchaikovsky, who's sadly no longer with us. But we were founded in 1983 and since then we've worked in Holloway in various different shapes and forms over the years. I found it very interesting when they announced the closure uh, that not very many people were expecting because I too believe that women shouldn't be in prison. But when they closed that prison, I was surprised at my own reaction. Oh, but not Holloway, because that's the, the institution I have the most relationship with. Um, and the women, my observation of the women uh, in the years that I've been working there is that they too have a relationship with the institution. In the mind of the public, when you were to say women in prison, they tend to think of Holloway. So for me, that's an interesting leap because often people don't consider what happens inside prison very much. They might think of orange jumpsuits that they've seen on television vision in America, they might uh, think of bad girls episodes that I've, that I've written, but they'll probably eventually, within a few sentences, reach Holloway and what Holloway means. And the closure of Holloway, I think, affords an opportunity to revisit what prison means for women and to change that narrative and to try and, you know, build something out of the embers of the distress that has been in there and the pain and suffering and do something kind of meaningful. If we were to close a hospital suddenly, and 500 women who have a roof over their head and who are getting care and support were to be shunted off down to Surrey. We kind of question it a bit more, I think, but I think yeah. the closure of Holloway seems, seems like a good idea. Well, there'd be nicer facilities in Downview, but actually women will be further away from their families. Children will have to trek all the way, and I know Surrey isn't a million miles away, but it's not £1.60 on the bus. You know, it's not a bus right away, it's a train, it's a change, it's a, you know, it's another bus, it's 13 pounds, it's two hours out of someone who's probably a family member caring for the children, trying to bring them down to maintain that family relationship uh, with their mother. And the, the closure of, you know, the closure of Holloway and all the reports and the run up was never kind of flagged up or never recommended. Yeah. So it is kind of coming out of blue and lots of organisations and lots of uh, civil servants are trying to respond to that in the best way possible and we believe that one of the better ways that we could do is to use what Holloway means to the public and the kind of image to reconjure that into something different using that, that kind of that image um, and meaning behind the institution and keeping something there of it and turning it into something positive. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, well, I have to say that I agree with, with a lot of what's been said. Um, as you heard, I spent some time in Holloway. I have no nostalgic feelings about Holloway at all. Um, it was a very cold place. Um, the one first cell I was put into, um, or I was allocated, had absolutely had no curtain, and it was just absolutely extraordinary being in it. Fortunately, everyone rallied around, and the women were amazing there in terms of the type of cooperation you got, and found me uh, another cell and loads of blankets. Apparently, you were only given one, allowed one blanket at a time, and I got five by the time uh, the doors were locked. Um, but I did recommend in my book, I'm an economist, um, I did only spend four days in Holloway and that was enough. Uh, and then I spent two months in an open prison and I think the open prisons are the jewel in the crown of the prison service. The nonsensical approach in the criminal justice system where it is quite obvious that prisons don't work, as we just heard. There is reoffending that happens uh, almost immediately and it costs us between 9 billion and 13 billion a year. Um, it clearly isn't uh, doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, prisons are not a, um, a disincentive to commit a crime. All the academic literature shows this very, very clearly. In fact, you go to prison and you're much more likely after that to become a criminal. Uh, and a repeat one of that. Once they spend from seven in the evening until eight the following morning locked up, and in the weekends, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they get locked up at five. So I was getting ready for this, because um, I got on in on a Monday, and I thought, how exactly am I going to survive that thing on? And I had full admiration for all these people who were able to do this. Uh, and. Uh, and unfortunately, I was moved to an open prison on Friday morning, so I didn't have to endure that. But I had already started talking to my TV set, uh, which, of course, greatly want to take away from everybody. And uh, uh, they do say that's the first sign of madness in prison. Uh, I actually still talk to uh, the TV set now. Uh, and it's, I don't think it necessarily is a sign of madness. It's, it's actually quite, quite comforting. But uh, I can imagine what I would have been like if I had to spend uh, all that time by myself. And there were remand prisoners loads of remand prisoners and of course they come and go the 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 the, the permanent ones if you call, call them that because of course they all go out again and they don't stay there for very long uh, couldn't stand the remand prisoners because they were disruptive i mean 50 percent of these girls eventually do not get given a custodial sentence and yet they may be spending months in prison being ferried around and the relief when somebody would actually be taken to court and maybe was going to stay not in in the premises that night, because many of them were terribly disturbed. Uh, the separation from loved ones, separation from children. You do know that the statistics about depression that hits women in particular, the, the statistic that, in fact, I get all the time by reading what uh, these uh, ladies here produce every month, um, is that women represent only 5% <coughs> of the prison population, and yet they account for a third of all the attempts at self-harm. So uh, why did I recommend the closure? Not only because uh, I can think of better uh, things to do with life than necessarily having something like that that's still there in the middle of, of London. But also because I saw it going hand in hand with the closure, or with a re reduction in the number of women who go to prison. And I wrote in my book, and I had this very firm belief that all these fantastic organisations which go around saying how appalling it is to put women in prison, even, even uh, a, a governor of Holloway said that of the 490 women who were there at the time, maybe it was 460, only 50 should stay there. The rest should not be in prison. And yet we put them there. When I see now the Justice Department having its budget cut, I scream with, with delight because I know that that's what is behind the sale of Holloway and that is what is behind the rethink of what to do with women. What you needed to do, I said, is sell prime properties don't know what's going to happen to the women's centre, to the visiting centre, sell, make money out of that, use it for the smaller number of prisoners that you keep uh, locked up, but make absolutely certain the money spent on education and ensuring that they get employment at the end of the day, because it's education and employment that stop crime and stop reoffending. They are the closest things that you can have in terms of the correlation that exists between what you can do to reduce crime that costs society so much. But I think it is a step in the right direction, as long as it is followed also by a rethink of what we do with women. Uh, and it is a real disgrace what's going on at present. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you.